coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant with me, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. I will be their God, and they will be my people. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wrongdoing. piece has the great musical tradition about it and also the joy, which is also so much like Tom, uh, tradition and joy, and so it's a, a great and fitting tribute. We turn now to our gospel reading from the 12th chapter of John's gospel. Some Greeks who were visiting Jerusalem during the Passover asked to see Jesus, and that results in Jesus telling them a parable and thinking with them about life and death and resurrection. Let us stand together for the reading. Some Greeks were among those who had come up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and made a request, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Jesus replied, The time has come for the human one to be glorified. I assure you that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it can only be a single seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their lives will lose them, and those who hate their lives in this world will keep them forever. Whoever serves me must follow me. Wherever I am, there my servant will be also. My Father will honor whoever serves me. Now I am deeply troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this time? No, for this reason I have come to this time. Father, glorify.
glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Jesus replied, this voice wasn't for my benefit, but for yours. Now is the time for judgment of this world. Now this world's ruler will be thrown out. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. He said this to show how he was going to die. And this is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, we know this season of Lent is a season of honesty. And in that mood of honesty, we assess ourselves before Almighty God, and honestly, we don't entirely like what we see. We stumble into the process of trying to make amends in our lives, and it doesn't work, at least not exactly. Turns out it really isn't in us to make everything just right. Turns out we need God. We need to subscribe to a new kind of citizenship, citizenship in the rule of God, the coming rule of God, the kingdom of God, that place where the cross and where resurrection are for us the bottom line. Excuse me. The prophet Jeremiah gives voice to our situation of being broken, of having broken faith with God, having broken our promises, having broken covenant, in view of all the ways that we have failed, Jeremiah audaciously dares to anticipate a new radical way forward. What's been tried isn't really working, so Jeremiah imagines a new deal with God. More about that in a moment. The Jeremiah text this morning is one of those terrific hinge passages in scripture. There are a few of these in the Bible that allow the verses to open a brand new door for us. The old covenant is broken, says God. What will God do? Well, God would be justified, of course, in exercising God's fierce and righteous judgment. Remember the obliteration of all things at the time of Noah when God destroyed the world for its brokenness because the human creation had corrupted and violated everything. Or some other judgment. Remember the terrible, fiery serpents that God sent to bite the people, those disobedient people in the wilderness of Edom, for the punishment of exile. The whole nation of Judah in about the year 600 BCE, trucked off to foreign pagan Babylon and there made to set up housekeeping in the ghetto, set hard behind the stinking canals of that hell city. What do you do with a broken covenant, a broken deal, a broken promise with God, except that filled with righteous indignation, you mete out the strict and swift punishment to those deal breakers. But suddenly, at this point, the pivot on the hinge opens and the whole thing begins to swing wide and there is a new way, even a new world. Turns out God will try again Even though God was our husband and we were God's bride, we did not keep our marriage vows. Still, God will try again. This new way begins to play out. It will, as we find, as Christians, we find it will come to the cross and it will come to resurrection. It begins to play out. Today, for instance, in the gospel reading, certain Greek people, people who surely were slightly disoriented, out of place, Greeks in Jerusalem, people like we are, if we are honest with ourselves, certain 
Greeks in Jerusalem for worship say that they want to see Jesus. We want to see a a new deal framed in forgiveness. We want to see hope. We want a chance in our lives to put things right again. We want to see Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the living picture of this new deal that God enacts. You want to see what's happening? Look at Jesus. You want to live as a citizen in the coming kingdom of God? Follow Jesus. You want a new deal? Live for Christ. It is at this point that Jesus offers another one of his famous earthy parables. Jesus says that life in this new way of living, life in this new covenant is like, like wheat falling to the ground before it comes to life again as a whole magnificent field of grain. That parable, of course, is self referential on Jesus' part. Jesus will, with his own body, prove that there is a new deal. Not the old deal, a new deal. And he will prove it with this, death on a cross and life brought out of an open tomb. What should we say? Jesus asked that question. By all this, God is glorified, is the answer. God's great goodness glorified. And of course, God's glory is seen not in the judgment that we would naturally expect, but in a bold new reparation of all things for us. A new deal, not like the old deal. God's deal. Setting right what we have not been able to set right ourselves. Even even life not death. Now is the judgment of this world, Jesus says. Now the old way is being thrown out, and I, when I am lifted up, that sounds like resurrection, will draw all people to myself. New day, new world, new life, new promise, a promise that God has determined to keep for us so that we might be saved. Jeremiah tells us that we will somehow be able to inhale God's word and be filled with God's purpose. I will put my law within them, the scripture says. And the scholar Walter Brueggemann says this is inhaling the law of God. Because as he puts it, the Torah law will be actualized and accepted as one's own way of living. God's way is the right way. God's way is attention to the neighbor. A willingness to accept life, the life we have, as a crowning gift from God. And with that, violence and hatred are set aside, prejudice is suspended, it's not God's way to live in anger, so God has made a new way, even a new way among those with whom God has most reason to be angry. Well, you can live like this too. I will write it on your hearts, says God. Life and forgiveness will flourish. Jeremiah sees that we will soon enough come to know God. And when Jeremiah talks about knowing God, it's not the formal theology of a thick textbook. No, it's more like emotional intimacy. By this brand new way of living, we will come to treasure a relationship, emotional relationship with Almighty God. We Christians will look to the cross, and when we do so, we will be moved by the devastation that Jesus takes on for all of us. And we will be 
exhilarated by a tomb left empty at Easter, by a grain of wheat that falls and dies and then comes to life again abundantly. Now, of course, we've tried other things, parties to distract us, bank accounts to make us feel as secure, sinkhole insurance if you can get it. But these things are all part of the old deal. They are just temporary securities, aren't they? God has something new. Jeremiah tells us that the hallmark of this new thing is forgiveness. I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This glorifies God. It asserts God's way. All the other ways are now set aside. God's way, forgiveness. On this special day when we're honoring Tom Moody, it's, I hope, appropriate to ask a kind of whimsical question. What if Jeremiah, or those Greeks that once asked to see Jesus for that matter, what if they had known Tom Moody? Tom, with his affection for God's word and God's way, especially as that purpose of God is expressed in the music of the church. Tom, who we might say has indeed inhaled that word and has shown that he has inhaled that word by his remarkable career, a long-standing, well, long-sitting at the organ bench anyway, career. Tom, whose emotional relationship with Almighty God is in fact, a passionate relationship and a relationship that informs him on how to live and love. Tom, who is so accepting and forgiving of others. Tom, who has as much as any of us ever has accepted this new deal that God is offering, citizenship under the loving, forgiving, transforming rule of God. Examples, like the one that Tom gives us, examples give us a way to see how we might live in this new and saving way. Again, look to the cross because it is Lent, but lift up your eyes even beyond that, beyond the cross, and imagine together, let us imagine what life may yet hold for us, what life well lived will yield, what life can be like when we breathe in God's word and purpose, when we engage God emotionally and fully, when we learn to forgive, when we feel the power of being forgiven. What if Jeremiah or the Greeks had known Tom Moody? Well, What really matters is that God knows all of us and invites us to know God better. And God, in knowing us, rescues us and all to the glory of God. And thanks be to God this day. Amen. And let us pray. Lord, we do ask that all of our celebrations might be tied to that great celebration of Easter and empty tomb. And so today, as we give thanks for all the things that have happened around us, for the strength of our church, for the goodness of our connection to Tom Moody and to other friends here, we do pray that in all of that we will see your hand and we will be directed to life which is fulfilled by caring and loving and sharing and blessing that we might be a bless a blessing to others. And these things we pray in Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>
affirmation of faith this week uh, calls us to look to the cross, and that affirmation is found printed in our order of worship. Together, let us say what we believe. We believe that in the death of Jesus on the cross, God achieved and demonstrated once for all the costly forgiveness of our sins. Jesus Christ is the reconciler between God and the world. He acted on behalf of sinners, as one of us, fulfilling the obedience God demands of us, accepting God's condemnation of our sinfulness. In his lonely agony on the cross, Jesus felt forsaken by God and thus experienced hell itself for us, yet the Son was never more in accord with the Father's will. He was acting on behalf of God, manifesting the Father's love that takes on itself the loneliness, pain, and death that result from our waywardness. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not holding our sins against us. Each of us beholds on the cross the Savior who died in our place, so that we may no longer live for ourselves, but for him. In him is our only help of salvation. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. The world is buzzing all around us, good and gracious God. But we have come here surrounded by faces, some familiar and some new to us, all of us hoping and wondering if somehow in worship we will meet you today. So here we are with all our doubts and questions, wavering wills and shortcomings, and you have ministered to us in this hour of worship. Despite our often frail and feeble faith, we ask you to speak to us through the words of the hymns and anthems and challenge and inspire us through the scripture and the word that we have heard by our pastor and sermon. Meet us at our point of need, Lord, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, speak your living word deep into our souls. Help our community to transition from the community of myself to myself for the community. And let us open our hearts to all others. Let us move from egoism to love, from death to the resurrection. Let us pass from the land of slavery to a promised land, the land of inner freedom. Eternal God, you feed the hungry and satisfy the thirsty. You walk with the lonely and travel with the desperate. You comfort those who mourn. We have no needs that you cannot meet. This morning, we pray for those who are sick and who need your gift of healing, especially Nelson Rue, who asks all of the prayers of the whole church for him today. For Tucker Carmichael and his family, in the death of Tucker's uncle, for Bob Womble, Nancy English's brother after surgery, and for Kelly Goad and for his sister Diane. And today, O oh Lord, we thank you for Tom Moody. He was called by you to be our organist, to share his talents and gifts, to inspire and lead our worship, to assist us in praise and thanksgiving, and give us a glimpse of the beauty and glory of God. We thank you for him. And unite us in the church's family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In our worship, we try to express ourselves as beautifully as we can. The wonderful music 
the well-worded sermons and prayers, the pure sound of the choir's voices, the power of the organ Tom Moody has played for 50 years. It all speaks to our desire to offer our best to God. The time of the offering is significant as a time to give our best. In faith, let us come before God with our tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Again, O oh God, we are always grateful to give of ourselves, and so we are glad for this time in worship. Uh, bless us from here to give ourselves ever more extravagantly, ever more generously for your will and purpose in the world. Uh, bless us that we might indeed be a blessing to others in Christ's name. Amen.
please do remember the reception immediately following this service of worship. Who could forget downstairs in the fellowship hall? Also, remember, we're going to sit for just a moment and listen to uh, the postlude following the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and the life everlasting. Amen. And please be seated.